Perfect. So, good uh, afternoon. Uh, welcome to our uh, new season of the Partner Seminar Series. I'm very happy that our uh, talk series, I'm going to start with a presentation by Gabor. I believe everybody knows Gabor. He's <laughs> assistant professor at the Department of Political Science. He specializes in uh, randomized experiments. He's doing a lot of research with uh, randomized experiments and public opinion. So I'm really excited about his talk today. Without any further ado, please go take the floor. Happy to have you today. Thank you. Uh, I'm very glad to have you all here and uh, basically returning uh, the seminar to a physical space where we can like chat and, and see each other, but obviously also happy to have a bunch of other people who are following us. So this is all great. Uh, it's also nice to organize a departmental seminar because it means that you can just present stuff whenever you want. The other people uh, are fine with it. And uh, what I wanted to say about this project is that the one thing that makes me especially happy about presenting this at CEU is that um, this is like a very CEU project. And the reason why it's a CEU project is that it actually grew out from the MA thesis of uh, Alex Ushnak, who I believe is all, also here. Uh, he was a student here who graduated two, two years ago. And um, so this is totally his idea. And he, and he wrote a really great MA thesis on it using, uh, on, uh, he collected his own data and I, I was his supervisor and I really liked this project. And we started to work on it some more, and then uh, Ben Se, who was writing, uh, Ben Se, who is a current PhD student, he joined in, because he was writing his uh, thesis on something related, and then we were kind of like brainstorming about it, the, the three of us, and then eventually, I also uh, contacted uh, another ex-CU friend of mine, Ferenc Suic, who I think is not here now, and, um, and he also kind of contributed with his knowledge on, on formal theory, which I'm not going to show you a lot of, but uh, but it's, it's like for CU slash XCU people. So, so it's, it's great to present it here. The last caveat is that this is um, ongoing research. It's, it has been ongoing for, for quite a few years now, but it's still not done. So it's, uh, it's a great time to present it, and I'm very much open to any kind of questions. And I'll, I'll start the presentation, and at some point I'm going to... Uh, give the space to Ben, so he's going to talk about the uh, empirical results we have. So why don't we jump in? As you will see, this is, about, this is a paper about uh, scandals, political scandals uh, in general, and more specifically, I'll talk about an aspect of uh, political scandals that have been mostly overlooked in the political science literature. And this is how politicians react in, with their communication after they are accused of some wrongdoing. And I wanted to motivate it with uh, a picture of two uh, ex-American presidents. And one um, shared feature or one commonality between these two presidents is that they were both accused of uh, wrongdoings. And specifically, they were both accused of uh, sexual harassments or sexual wrongdoings. And uh, but there is one important difference between I mean, there are many differences between uh, uh, Clinton and Trump, but one of them was the way they eventually responded to the accusations that they got. And I wanted to show you these uh, two responses. And I probably have there, yeah. So I, I, I was gonna ask you to guess who said which, but uh, I mean, you, it's probably like, gonna be very easy. So Clinton said that indeed I did have a relationship with uh, Ms. Lewinsky that was not appropriate. In fact, it was wrong. I misled people, including even my wife. I deeply regret that. So this is um, a type of communication that uh, we'll be referring to as an apology, because it, it, it actually says that the accusations were true, and he says sorry. Okay. In contrast, this is another response to another uh, sex scandal accusation by Trump who said that uh, he never met that particular person in his life. She's trying to sell a new book that, that should indicate her motivation. It should be sold in the fiction session. So she basically, he basically says that these accusations are 
BS. It's just uh, lies. And this is another kind of uh, response that politicians could, uh, could use in their communication, which you will call a denial. So they'll simplify this whole world uh, to a huge extent. And uh, as the, the title of the presentation suggests, you'll, you'll uh, explore when and why politicians use these two kinds of uh, uh, communication strategies and how it affects um, voter perceptions. So the, the two puzzles uh, that we were trying to address is uh, that we see these two kinds of uh, communications. We also see that, I mean, I think anyone who reads the news probably would, would say that, well, uh, denials are way more common than apologies, which is, which is true, but there's still variation in these uh, communications that we want to explain. And uh, we also want to explore all these, whether or not these communications matter for voters. And we, we kind of think that they do because otherwise uh, they wouldn't be employed. They could just, politicians could just say, I don't want to talk about this. Um, so just to recap what we do. Um, so as I said, we so I have, I have a, 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 on uh, two kinds of scandals. So this is kind of um, studies building on each other. We, we have one study which is complete now, which looked at uh, sex scandals. And then we look at another kind of uh, scandals which are about corruption. And we simplify this world of possible communication types of these two, which are denials and apologies. Uh, what we do empirically is that we ran survey experiments. So this is basically exposing citizens to different fictional uh, scandals and communications that ensue and uh, ask them various questions about uh, these fictional politicians. And then something that we are kind of uh, wrangling with now in Ferenc Dars is that we build a formal model that tries to build on this experiment to make predictions about what's kind of the optimal strategy for politicians. So, so this is kind of the weird thing about this project that ultimately we are much more interested in the behavior of uh, politicians than how voters react to what, whatever politicians do, but we have no power to, you know, like randomly accuse politicians of things and see what they do. This is just, I mean, in principle, we could do that. It would be much tougher than uh, just experimenting with the public. And then at the end, we, what, what we are doing, and we have some versions of that, but we are not entirely convinced yet, is that we can use uh, our formal models. So this is basically like game theoretical models there, there is a strategic interaction between voters and, uh, and politicians. And we can, we can use our experimental data to estimate these models structurally so that we can um, kind of like make predictions based on the model for, 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 for types of scandals that we don't actually study. So that's kind of the neat thing about uh, uh, kind of combining models with data. So I'm gonna talk about Theory is not going to be like it's, it's a very a theoretical paper. The main reason why this paper is there are two reasons why this paper is a theoretical. The, the first one is that I don't really know how to do theory too much, and I think like we are not none of our us are very good at that. And then <clears throat> also this is this is not really a field where you can um, rely on so many kind of like core ideas. So there we have, so, so the reason why I said theory slash intuitions is that we have some intuitions that we formalize using a model. And I think these kind of intuitions are kind of common sense, but we are going to test these intuitions anyway. And what we are going to do is to see what kind of predictions we can get from, from our perspective, pretty consensical intuitions. Um, so, so the first intuition that we that I want to share is that what's at stake in a scandal? And the, the first argument we make is there are actually two things that are at stake. The first, the first one is, which is more obvious, is whether a politician committed some wrongdoing or not. So this is kind of a, some unobserved event in many cases to the, to the voters. They either believe that some um, sexual harassment or corruption or other kind of wrongdoing happened, or they don't believe it. This is, I mean, if you look at surveys about uh, perceptions of uh, 
you know, whether some accusations are true, there are always people who believe things and there are other people who don't. And then the other less, more, more subtle aspect of these scandals is that the politicians usually are forced to say, say something about these accusations. And then voters also form some beliefs about whether they are telling the truth. And what we argue is that, that, that for voters, both of these things matter. So they, so they want politicians to not to do bad stuff, but I also want them to, to be sincere. And I mean, I could try to come up with some theory of why, but, but I, I feel like it's kind of like commonsensical. They, maybe you can make the argument that they, they want um, politicians to be sincere because then that would make them feel that they would be sincere about other things too. But this is just their preferences. Um, so the first, like not, not like super trivial innovation that we have is that, that these two communication tools, apologies and denials, they create a trade-off given these two things at stake. So the, so the trade-off is about this. So denials are cheap talk in the sense that from the perspective of the wrongdoing, it always makes sense for politicians to deny things because it, that would mean that they didn't do the thing. Okay, so apologies are more costly because if you apologize, that, that means that you're kind of intentionally creating an impression that you did something wrong. But because of that, voters are likely to think that someone who denies could be either innocent or a liar. Okay, so, so in a way, uh, apologizers are seen as honest sinners, which could be better or worse, theoretically, from being a, a, an innocent person with some probability and a, and a liar with, you know, like one minus that probability. So this is, there, is, there is some trade off. That's the first intuition. Um, so, so just to summarize, it, what, what we mean by that is that voters are likely to update based on uh, the way politicians communicate about the accusations, both in terms of what they feel about their honesty and what they feel about or, or feel about, think about their guiltiness. The second intuition, which is, to me, that's intuitive, but I wouldn't be surprised if the data said uh, otherwise, but we, we actually thought that was going to be the case, believe it or not. This is, this is something we call hypocrisy. So uh, what I mean by hypocrisy is when someone tries to appear kind of unreasonably good. So, or especially when someone... Um, lies about some kind of minor things where, where it could be okay to say that they did it. And so the way we formalize this is that uh, there could be, so, so what I mean by this is that there could be some accusations where voters like it better than politicians just apologize when they lie about it and then, it, and then they are revealed to be sinners. You know? So, and, the, and, and our intuition about, uh, about this is that voters care more about lying in the case of an accusation, which is not that serious, okay? So if you're accused of um, stealing a lollipop when you were a kid from a store, and you say that I I've never stolen anything, and it turns out that you lied, it's much worse when you say that, um, I mean, it's not much worse, but then people care about the lying more than the act itself, whereas if you, you know, like you um, killed someone and you deny it, then, you know, like the act of killing is more problematic than the act of denying the killing. That's what we mean by hypocrisy. So, so the way we, we formalize is that lying matters more for less serious accusations. Um, and apology, so that, that, that implies that when we consider the effect of the communication itself, that what we hypothesize is that apologies hurt more in the case of serious accusations. So, so it basically means that if you're accused of something really, really bad, it makes more sense to deny it than when you're accused of something uh, kind of light, if that makes sense. It may, maybe I should stop and ask if, if that makes sense to you. Before Great. we continue, there, yes. I think there's something. Sorry, I can't. I can't. Uh, I only have one set of eyes, so. I know whether we should just check past. More, more. 
more. to the right more, chat. Oh, this is just uh, what he's saying that okay, they're sorry. recording. This is great. Who will be? <clears throat> okay, so this was a kind of a hunch, if you want, about how um, voters react to apologies and denials, depending on whether the accusations were serious or not so serious. Okay, so the last bit which complicates things is the following. So, and this was this was actually, I think, the, the, the coolest part of this theoretically, which is what if it never makes sense to ap apologize? Like, we could have an intuition that it never makes sense to apologize because, uh, because maybe any kind of uh, wrongdoing that you commit is so bad it doesn't really matter if you if, if some people think that you lie compared to the cost of some people coming to believe that you actually sin. Okay, so what, what could be another reason why people would apologize? And our argument is that like the key reason actually why people would apologize is that they are afraid that later on some evidence is revealed and everyone is going to know that they sinned. So, it's, so, so they are kind of punished twice. They are punished for being a sinner and they are punished for being a liar. Okay, so that's kind of the, the intuition here. And so for this, you need to have in, in this imagined game, you need to have this third phase. So the first phase was the accusation. The second phase was the communication. And the third phase is then potentially some new evidence comes to light, okay? Someone took a photo of you accepting a big envelope or someone, um, you know, like someone that you had an inappropriate relationship uh, actually kept some um, presents that you gave her or something like that. And so, so, so argument here, and I think that's, that's pretty intuitive that if guiltiness is revealed, then apology is ex post optimal. So, you know, like when you deny something, and, and then it becomes clear that you actually did it and you kind of wish that you had it. So if we kind of like flip this logic, then if you are pretty sure that at some point everyone is gonna know that you sinned, then you are more likely to apologize than if you don't expect that. Um, and we also kind of make the same argument about this cost of lying thing in terms of uh, serious versus not so serious uh, uh, accusations, and we, we argue that this extra cost that you face for lying, actually people knowing for sure that you lied, that's a, that's a bigger deal for uh, more serious accusations and a smaller deal for serious accusations. Okay, so this is, this is all we, we, are, we are trying to, to say here, okay? And then you, we, we have this formal model, and from this formal model, we try to get out equilibrium predictions for politicians too. So, so the, the predictions for politicians are based on what we assume voters to like, and these are partly testable, and I'm gonna show you that our intuitions were correct. So based on this, you, you might want to believe our predictions about what politicians do, even though we, we don't really have data on anything that politicians uh, do. So, our predictions, and these predictions are about the behavior of politicians. First, is that apologies are more likely to be made after lighter accusations, so not so serious accusations. And also, apologies are more likely if there is a possibility for new evidence that can be revealed. And I think it's, this is something that I would love to explore empirically. It would be kind of tough to collect data on kind of accusations and responses. But I think what's neat about it is that uh, the seriousness of an accusation and the ex ante probability that some evidence is gonna be found, these are kind of uncorrelated in some ways. So you could think of uh, an accusation that's very serious, but it's like really, really hard to, to prove. And I think uh, any kind of um, sex, sexual assault or uh, accusation is, it, probably falls into this bin. It's, it's very hard to prove them, but they're very serious. We can also think of accusations which are kind of light, 
but are very easy to find out. So, so, so you could think of this as a matrix and we make predictions about each, like in terms of each dimension. Okay, so just to summarize, um, you consider these two strategies, uh, the rationale about them um, depends on what, what politicians want to, to kind of optimize, like whether they, that they're uh, apparent honesty or the, the lack of their, or their innocence. Um, how they are vary, like how they how we think these responses will vary in their effectiveness as a function of the seriousness of the accusation, as a function of whether there is evidence. And so these are the predictions we make. Okay. I'll talk about what we did uh, in terms of the experiment. Okay. So um, we kind of simulate these scandals. Okay. So the way we did it is that we come up with. Um, accusations that could be made. We actually base these accusations uh, on real political scandals. And we, and then we ask survey respondents who read these accusations, if they would, if they think that the politician in question should resign. That's the basic design, okay? And then we vary different things in this experiment. So first we vary the seriousness of the accusations. Okay, I'll, I'll show uh, some examples of that. We vary the type of the communication. So there's a second stage. So after reading the accusations, some, some respondents read a response from the, polit from, from the politician in question, which is either an apology or a denial. Then we also vary whether respondents receive some additional evidence that shows that the accusations were indeed true. And that's it. I'm going to show you an example, OK? Um, so this is um, from the second set of experiments we ran that were about corruption. So this is a story about a newly elected congressman in the US who was accused of a conflict of interest because this, that person spent a weekend on a yacht uh, that's owned by uh, some, some media czar. And, um, and uh, that was just not, not okay because there is some uh, limit on in the US on the value of the gifts that you can, uh, that you can uh, receive. But basically the, 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 what matters in this accusation is that it's kind of, um, how do you say that? It's a gift that's not like huge, and there is no quid pro quo involved. So it's, it's, it kind of remains unclear, like what this guy asked from the politician in return. In contrast, we have a more serious accusation, which is that the same person got a bunch of cash from the same media mogul. And the accusation also says that in return, this uh, business person wanted this congressman to support some um, some bills that would be favorable for for him. So 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 we argue that I mean, for our purposes, what matters is that we think that this is an accusation which is like kind of borderline. Like we, we could even think that most most politicians do stuff like that. And like even if you think that most politicians do stuff like this, it's like much more problematic. So we want this is how we vary the seriousness of the scandals. In the other experiment where we use um, sex scandals, it, it maybe is even, it's even more varied. We have a scandal where uh, someone is uh, accused of having um, an extramarital but consensual affair with their staff member. And the other extreme is that someone is accused of rape. And then we have different accusations in between. So, so there I will show you empirically that voters or not voters, uh, survey takers are actually able to kind of pick up these differences in uh, perceived seriousness of accusations. Okay, um, maybe I, are we doing on time? Not so good. One, one hour. So, um, I mean, I, maybe if you, if, if you feel like you can just have a look so um, this is, I just wanted to show you kind of the, the, the style of the text that they got uh, about communication. 
So um, it was just sort of a generic text where a politician said that uh, this is just not true. The accusations are not true. Um, and in the apology condition, is the, the, the same politician says that, uh, yes, that happened. It's pretty bad. And he's not going to do it again. And he's sorry. And then some part, like some respondents in the experiment finally also received um, this paragraph, which contained a, not, like a last bit of the story about new evidence coming to light in which, um, in which you know, photos were taken on this yacht and then some, uh, some other, um, you know, like some other evidence uh, was surfaced about you know, the communication between these two parties. So it, 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 we basically wanted to com convey the idea to these uh, subjects in our experiment that we can be pretty sure that it actually happened. Okay. I'm gonna talk about the data and then I, I, I give it to Ben for the results. So how we collected data, we used uh, something called the population-based experiment, which is kind of an uh, euphemism for saying that we paid kind of like weird people um, to take surveys, but it's kind of like not like very bad. It's a, it's a online sample from a, a survey vendor called Lucid. And what's nice about it is that even though these people are weird, but they use uh, quotas. So we have a sample that, that kind of looks like the, the American population in terms of age, gender, ethnicity, and region. And in other things, it's, it's somewhat different, but it's kind of like, okay. Uh, so it's kind of better than asking uh, college students to do this and like worse than paying like a hundred times more for, for like a, a good survey firm to do the same thing. Um, we measure, three things. So the, our, our outcomes are perceived seriousness of the scandal. So we ask people, like, do you think that this is a, a really serious scandal, a not so serious scandal, uh, not, not serious at all scandal, and, and so on. Um, perceived likelihood, which is, which was, do you think that, that these accusations are true, or you don't know, or false? And more importantly, we asked them if they thought that the uh, politicians should resign. That's our main outcome question. The first two are mainly for uh, the purpose of us knowing if the respondents actually picked up the manipulations. And we did um, two studies, just to kind of recap. Uh, the first one was uh, the, sketch, the sex scandal. The other was the corruption scandal. They kind of like, we tried to triangulate by varying different bits and pieces for the two. So the first study, we kind of amped up the number of different scandals to kind of have a, a continuous distribution of not so serious, kind of serious, very serious, extremely serious scandals. And then we also um, varied the partisanship of the congressman because we were interested in whether this whole thing I was talking about plays out differently if, you know, like if it's about a party, if the, if the person is coming from a party that you like or dislike, or we just don't doubt people, the party. And it turns out that it doesn't really matter too much. So for the second study, we just kind of ignore this. Um, the first study, we haven't included this part about evidence. So we, not, no one was, uh, no one got, no one was in the context. So no one actually learned what happened. Um, and finally, in, this, in the second study, we also included these repeated measures. So that, that, what that means is that we, after each stage of the experiment, we asked respondents each of these questions. So, so we can actually look at how they update across different uh, parts of the experiment. Okay, so on this note, I, I give the floor to Vansa. So, uh, hi everyone, I'm John the uh, people who works on this experiment, I'm Vence. Uh, so, I'm going to introduce the results of this experiment. It's important to know that the, in case of the first uh, experiment, uh, it, it, was a, it, it, it was a kind of a already a big sample study. Uh, we have around 8,000 people in that sample, so it's very well powered and it's, uh, it shows very uh, convincing results in terms of uh, statistical power. Uh, whilst in the, in the case of the second study, it's still as a, in a pilot phase. Um, 
I'm going to start with the, the first experiment, and that's the sex candles. So Gabor already uh, told you the summary of the design, but um, we can just repeat that. This experiment was basically, uh, we were interested about one of the factors that could vary uh, the relative effects of denials versus apologies. And that was how the higher seriousness changes uh, these relative effects based on the trade-offs and the intuitions, intuitions we just discussed. So from the lowest seriousness, the examinative effort, uh, we varied, we varied um, this kind of seriousness of the scandal conditions uh, to sexting, harassment, assault, or rape. Um, and after uh, respondents read this accusation, uh, in the second stage, uh, they received an update on the story, which shared how the politician responded to this communication. It was either an apology or denial, a vignette very similar to the one we showed in, showed in the example before. Uh, and yes, as, as Gabor said, here in this experiment, we were not really sure whether part, whether this whole communication matters at all, because now we live in a world where they say that partisan motivated reasoning is so important that the politicians can say whatever they want. If I like him, I will support him. If I don't like him, I won't support him. So there's this partisan motivated reasoning, and we wanted to test these communication effects in, the, in, in, in a kind of more externally valid environment. Um, and as Gabor said, we didn't test uh, the second factor, which we think, which we thought of being important in terms of whether uh, the relative effects of the two communication strategies, uh, the evidence. But this will come uh, later in the in the second experiment. Uh, so uh, just about the manipulation checks. Um, so the most important message based on this uh, two graphs that actually our manipulation was successful. In the first uh, figure, figure A, you can see that as we go higher on the seriousness, actually uh, respondents perceive the scandals more serious. And there is a kind of jump between uh, harassment and sexting. And it's very important because it will be shown in the resignation support too, that this is the kind of uh, threshold where the seriousness turns up. And this is where actually the two relative effects start to diverge too. So it's, it shows the validity of our, of our manipulation. Uh, and the other important part of the manipulation was how uh, the communications actually varied the likelihood, the, the, the um, perceived likelihood that this scandal happened. And as you can see, um, actually, here we utilize the kind of randomization that some of the respondents were asked about the likelihood, the perceived likelihood before reading the communication. So it's a kind of quasi control group. But some of the respondents were asked, asked after the communication. So basically, we could test the effects of apologies and denials, how they manipulate the perceived likelihood. And as you can see, apologies are very strong signals. Um, these are the kind of light gray uh, dots, uh, circle dots on the, on, on the graph. Uh, whilst in case of denial, there is a asymmetry of effect. Denials are not so efficient in varying, varying the perceived likelihoods. And this is some concern, but as you will see in the second experiment, maybe because the more elaborate denial vignette we showed, this, it, this will be symmetrical. So actually this, and in the end, this didn't really matter a lot, but <coughs> denials are less successful at uh, lowering uh, the likelihood, uh, uh, the, the perceived likelihood that, this, that the accusation is true. Uh, so this is, the, th these are, this is a very si simple graph uh, showing the results. As you can see, the X axis is basically the continuum from the uh, least serious to the most serious uh, uh, accusation. And on the y-axis, you can see uh, our main outcome, the resignation support. Um, and basically, I think the most important thing this, uh, this shows is that as the seriousness increases, mm -hmm. denials are marginally more efficient communication strategy in, in terms of mitigating mm -hmm. uh, voter sanctioning. And we think that this is this is basically a very strong support for our intuition that uh, lying matters more for less serious scandals. When the scandal is less serious, it, it does, it's, it's as important to know whether the politician, politician is honest or whether the politician did the wrongdoing. Whilst in case of more serious scandals, this lying uh, carries less weight in terms of the uh, voters' decision or final uh, uh, evaluation of the politician, the outcome, whether uh, the, the politician should uh, resign or not. Um, so, well, so this experiment basically summarizes that seriousness matters, and it it uh, it changes the relative effects of apologies compared to denials. And the more serious the scandal, the more important the the, the 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 more optimal 
to deny this strategy. However, we were at this stage, uh, we kind of were concerned about that this is not the full environment this kind of process is happening. Uh, politicians have to anticipate that evidence will surface. And based on that evidence, we think that evidence is the, the, the likelihood of uh, uh, that evidence surfaces is the second most Im the second important factor that will influence the relative effects of denials and uh, uh, apologies. Um, so this second experiment is still in pilot stage uh, with, with a smaller sample, uh, and uh, the we kind of change some aspects of the design. Uh, this is a bit of subject design and uh, with repeated measures, as Gabor said. Uh, this is we think this is a more powerful design, and also with the help of this kind of uh, three information stages, we can discern the individual trajectories of these communication strategies through the information stages, which are pre-communication, when respondents only read the, uh, the accusations, post-communication when the politician already uh, uh, made a response, and post-evidence when the respondents were shown uh, uh, evidence of guilt. Um, Right. Um, yeah, and, and very importantly, all the outcome measures were asked at each stage. So basically, in the end, we have from out, out of this small number of people of respondents, we made a bigger sample because uh, uh, this is not based on this within subject design. These were uh, allocated to different treatment groups. So each respondents actually belong to three treatment groups. Um, well, the other other thing we, we changed here, we don't want to see this continuum. It's it was proven, it was proven very nicely that uh, there is a continuous divergence between the two strategies as the seriousness increases. So we only focus on a low seriousness condition and the high seriousness condition. And um, yes, the communication state uh, are, are still the same. And we are not controlling for partisan alignments because it was shown very surprisingly for me at least <laughs> that in the first experiment. Uh, Partisanship mattered for the baseline uh, sanctioning of the scale of the wrongdoing or, or the, the level of the of the of the resignation support, but it was not the but, but voters, whatever is their partisan background, whether it was co-partisan or out-partisan, they updated to the communication to the persuasion uh, um, symmetrically. And this is something which is very surprising for partisan motivated reasoning. Anyway, uh, in this experiment, we were not uh, including partisanship to have a more uh, parsimonious design and also because we have evidence that it, it, it was not important in the first experiment. And most importantly, of course, uh, we shown uh, guilty evidence uh, for the respondents after they read the communication. So again, these are the manipulation checks. Just very shortly, the first uh, set of graphs show how through the different information stages, uh, the, the, the accusation stage, the communication stage and the evidence stage, how the respondents perceive seriousness changes in the different uh, uh, communication conditions. Uh, basically, very importantly, again, we managed to manipulate, again, the perceived seriousness, because you can see that in the low seriousness conditions, the mean perceived seriousness is lower, in the high seriousness conditions, it's, it's much higher, the absolute effects. Uh, in terms of um, the communication effects, denial somewhat decreases seriousness, we still have to find a good explanation for this. Maybe this is some kind of design related issue we will have to think of. Uh, in terms of the second manipulation check again, uh, the perceived likelihood. Uh, as you can see, again, this shows our expectations. Denials are very effective in the second stage. Now we are focusing on denials are very effective at lowering uh, the perceived likelihood, whilst apologies are basically maximizing the perceived likelihood that the accusation is true. But very importantly, and this says something about the kind of rational update of the voters, that after those who believed less that the accusation was true based on the denial, once they were shown the evidence, basically the, the denial effect completely disappeared. You can see that in the third stage, uh, the, the, the mean perceived likelihoods are balanced out uh, across the communications. Um, OK, so these are the results. Um, we are going to show the results at the two most important stages, post-communication stage and later the post-evidence stage. This is basically the same thing you could see in the first experiment, but of course with less uh, scandal conditions. Um, when there is no or ex, ex ante evidence or when there is no evidence yet, um, denials are a more effective strategy 
in, there in terms of mitigating uh, voter sanctioning. This is less true or not at all true for low seriousness condition. And this is again something that provides some kind of evidence uh, for our intuition that in case of low seriousness scandals, lying matters or honesty of the politicians matters as much as whether the, the, scan, uh, the, the accusation is true or not. But as, as we are moving to the higher seriousness condition, uh, scandal condition, uh, apologies are much more costly than denials. But this is what happens when we show the evidence. So basically what we thought of, thought about the relative effects of denials and apologies are completely flipped when we show evidence. Uh, in the low seriousness conditions, denial turned to be, uh, uh, become to be more uh, uh, costly uh, in terms of the mean resignation support. Uh, and in case of the high seriousness condition as well, but at a, at a, at a different uh, level. Uh, so basically, I think that this is the other important message to, 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 to share that uh, every denial can backfire and politicians have to anticipate the surfacing of evidence when they are make, when they are selecting between these uh, strategies. Um, just this is just a kind of easier way to compare uh, these two communication stages or the uh, post communication stage and the post evidence stage. As you can see, uh, basically uh, the relative effects completely turned upside down um, between the two uh, communication strategies. Uh, yeah, I think I throughout discussing the results, I already told you what we think are the most important takeaways uh, for the strategic behavior of the politicians based on uh, these empirical results we have from the experiments. Um, yes, and uh, I give the floor to Gabo now again. Okay. Thank you. The one, one thing I wanted to just to, I, I, to maybe just explain why we uh, use this second study. I just I'm going to go back to this. So here, so what, what kind of bothered me, and this is just kind of some details about how, like how, how do you design these studies kind of uh, building on, on top of each other. So something that kind of bothered me was that I wanted to see an example where it's actually better to apologize. And it kind of bothered me that I couldn't come up with, I thought that you know, having an extramarital affair that's consensual, that's really not a, a big deal for most people. So if you deny that, at least some people should think that you are a hypocrite. And if you apologize, then it just means that you are you know, just a normal human being who did something that's kind of questionable. But it still didn't work. And, and I, I really couldn't think of, at least in this context, like what would be something that we could call a scandal, but would be like here. And, uh, and, then, we, and then we came up with this other explanation of like, oh, so maybe this happens when uh, there is no chance that voters learn what's going on, then, then, then maybe that, that, could, that, could explain, um, that could explain why, um, um, why, the, why, why we observe any apologies. And then, so the limitations, um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's abstract in the sense that we are kind of getting rid of a bunch of, of moving parts in particular, we limit the set of uh, communication strategies. So there's this book that I think we, we kind of skimmed about uh, crisis communication, which lists like five different possible strategies. And then there are some papers that try to look at how these five different communication strategies can interact with like five different uh, types of scandals. And then what you get out of it is like a, a huge mass because remember, you kind of like look at how five different things compare, and just not very systematic. Um, and yeah, so the thing, and then the big problem is that, so whatever I told you, and I'm curious what, what you think, really, is that, is that all informative about the behavior of politicians? And I think it's, it partly is, but it's, it's not completely, right? Because in order to kind of explain what politicians do, you would need to, to obtain data on them. So we can only, in the end, we, we, we only, we're only able to find suggestive evidence and uh, that, that we can somehow fit into a model that could 
get us some evidence that's consistent with our expectations of what politicians do. But it's, it's, it's still very indirect. So, so if I can, um, so I will just look, look forward to answer any questions and happy to, about any, any kind of comment, but, but this is especially something that kind of troubles me of whether we achieve at any rate this, this goal of uh, learning stuff about politicians, not just um, voters. That's, that's the goal. Yeah, thank you so much. So, I guess we're gonna do this. We're gonna check what is uh, in the chat, and I will gather you guys on the list and call you one after another. Okay. So, just raise your hand so I put you on the list. I'm just gonna be I don't know all names. <laughs> Okay, so many questions. Should we start with these in the chat? Yeah, I'll start with the chat. Okay. Right, so Alexander asked, why do apologies hurt more in the case of a serious accusation? What proves it? Is it always better in terms of crisis communication to apologize? So, so, so I think like, Empirically, what proves it is the. So I'm not sure if I think this question might have been asked question before. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I think like our so in this in this model that we have is, which I didn't show you because when even this is like not finished yet. But the intuition is that you think of a, a kind of utility function for for voters that very very your very the degree to which you are upset. It's kind of the product of uh, how bad is the crime and like how like how probable you think it is that it happened. So you, you take the product of the two. And then if you deny, sorry, if you apologize, then you increase the probability that people think that you did it. And you just so so that's so you basically make it you, you, you Sorry, I'm just terrible at explaining like mathy things. But it basically you are amplifying a bigger thing if you are making people uh, more convinced that you did like a, a, a even worse thing. Whereas uh, we could think of uh, people caring about honesty to the same degree, regardless of the seriousness of the accusation. I think that that would be the best theoretical explanation I could give. Yeah. And then uh, Matisse. As I'm sure, I speak on behalf of everyone in the room, so you think that I've never in my entire life done anything. <laughs> okay. I agree with this. <laughs> Intuition three. Do you apologize for lying in the first place or do you apologize for what you've done? Right. I mean, do you apologize for what you've done? They apologize for what you did, right? After it's revealed, I guess. What do you apologize? Yeah, so it's it's in that ex post. So after it's revealed, uh, sorry, it's me, it's Dravko. Uh, so do you apologize for what you've done in the first place, or you also apologize for lying to them? No, 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 no. Sorry, so, I, so that's great. So, so the timing is so the uh, communication is is before the evidence. So we don't yeah. have, so we, in principle, uh, and I think, yeah, so I think what, I, what, what is important is that we could make it arbitrarily more complicated or longer because you could, we could have a stage in which you say something and then some evidence is revealed and then you, you could still apologize or you could still deny the veracity of the evidence. We kind of like cut it here. So, you, so, so we, we don't have a, an occasion for the politician to apologize for lying because he, the politician only says stuff before voters learn that they lied. Which is obviously, uh, I think maybe the reason why you asked it, I guess, is that like with the Clinton example, like he also apologized for lying, right? But be, be, but because it's it's much more complicated in real life, you have uh, a more dynamic thing where you 
different pieces of evidence are recovered. Does it make sense? Yeah, yeah, sure. Thanks. And then Levy said that anything sexual, wrongdoing is super bad. Right. So maybe maybe that was the, the problem that we, we um we were so when like in the very beginning when we were talking about this with uh, with, with Alex and then the first version of this was ran in Slovakia we were thinking of using um kind of like drug abuse as an example so you know like and then the light one would be that some politician got the drunk at the party and said like stupid stuff versus kind of like you know, like driving under the influence or like doing coke for like years or something like that. And we, we, we thought that maybe one good candidate for like a very unserious scandal if like in a country where everyone drinks, voters would learn that politician drinks too. But we didn't do that eventually. But maybe that would be a good... I agree that... Um, Should be good. Let's yeah. let's get her here. Yeah, there is one more. There is one more. Let's 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 get back to it. <laughs> let's, Sorry. let's mix it up a little. Mix bit. it up. I, I know who was first, but Mehmet, Mech- you wanted. Let's yeah. start with you. Yeah. So uh, similar to what Levi said. So the, in the second experiment, you didn't control for partisanship, but mm-hmm. sex scandals and corruption scandals are qualitatively very different, right? Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, first of all, corruption has to do with the taxes you pay, and the other one is somehow less related at least potentially in the eyes of people so i guess i mean there's nothing to do about it now but i think partisanship might actually matter in the second one because it's about money but how will it matter like because it's about you know how will it matter how would it manifest uh like i don't know maybe if uh, i mean i don't know like because it's about uh, taxes, basically, mm-hmm. and maybe two different partisan groups have different ideas about how uh, politicians who manage our taxes should behave, or uh, something like this. I don't know. But also, it's from Florida. Right. Maybe they, their perception of this senator will be from one party or another. So yeah. Right. I think it's. I think that's true. Probably. I. I also think that's probably true for for the sex like it, it it could plausibly be true for sex scandals so you could imagine that um like conservatives have different reactions to to and even like it could be like super complicated so maybe like maybe a conservative person is less okay with extramarital affairs but maybe a conservative person is kind of like less upset about the sex thing scandal because they think that people are just oversensitive. I, I don't know. Um, but, but I think the story we're going to tell is kind of like a general story, so an allegory if you want. And if you wanted to tell a story about, you know, like different, so it would be just, it would the design would explode if you cared about different partisan voters, different politicians that's like four groups and then different scandals different communications and whether there is evidence we would make comparisons they should you know 32 groups and it's not even about about like power but you just exponentially harder to come up with a theory that fits that kind of data and so i think um the, the other so we cannot we are at a point at we are writing two papers i just wanted to kind of present both because they're kind of very similar. <clears throat> I mean, one of the papers we get more into the depth of, um, of how partisanship matters. We, we actually had some intuitions more about you know, like you are more um, you are more lax in when you are when you hear about people that you like in the first place. So maybe you update differently when it's about a co-partisan versus an out-partisan. So it wasn't really about different parties and groups. And then this one, we, we just tried to kind of like stylize it more. But I, I agree with you that potentially there, there could be differences for sure. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Abbas? Yeah, uh, thank you very much for the beautiful presentation. I have two points. Mm-hmm. One is that uh, inspired by the Clinton uh, scandal that 
Originally, he denied. He said that I have never sex, had sex with that woman. Right. And then he apologized. So right. that, uh, that prompted me to say that maybe it is not, politicians don't have a clear cut strategy whether to deny or uh, apologize, you know. It's more longitudinal. They start with denying, and then you know some facts are coming, and they change their strategy, and then they apologize, as Clinton did. So, I think in real life it it happens more this sort of inconsistency. Uh, I don't know what, what is your reaction, or maybe to to see some initial phase and a later phase, and uh, and the other thing is this. Uh, uh, you have the option of denial or apologies. And what if somebody is not denying, not denying it, and he is not apologizing? Like uh, you know, there are different cultures. You know, in in, in France, sca sex scandals are sort of every day. So it's the U U.S. is very different. So François Hollande, you know, the president of France, you know, during the night he was escaping from the palace and you know going away with a young woman and uh, and he did not deny it actually as mm. far as i remember and and he also did not apologize maybe that is the exception but it can be a point of reference a possibility that in certain cultures like macho cultures you know it makes you even looking uh, better if you have such uh, scandals also so I don't know whether it can be included in the American. It, are you covering U.S. politics? That's a yeah. That's a specific, more specific. Right. So these are my two points. But it's more like a comment than a question. But maybe you have a reaction to that. No, I think you are totally right. So I think what what we are. I mean, if you want, we, we basically define. It's a bit very kind of circular, but we re define a scandal as an accusation that you you basically got to react to some where it's, it's, so it's already a negative thing to the person yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. um i mean you know maybe get at so i think we, we might have so ben said, mentioned that in the second experiment we, we we asked this question about you know do you think that person should resign do you think this person should resign and so on before they communicate. So in a way, we, we do have a condition where we measure what what worse think about the politician, whether the, they think the politician should resign in the absence of any response. So we do have data on that. Um, I don't remember what we... Yeah. And so the other thing is the popularity of the politician in matters also. So we, sure. it's not your research, but uh, I, I lived in the U.S. at the time of the lewinsky mm -hmm. uh, scandal, and uh, and uh, I asked an, an ordinary person, a track dive driver, what is his reaction, and he said, well, it's a wrongdoing, yes, he did bad thing, but he is a nice guy, everybody likes him, so what? So he was a very popular president at that moment, and, and uh, people forgave him this. That's why the impeachment did not work. But that's a, maybe you can include this or maybe but that's, not. That's other, other kind of, that could be another research, like what is the relative weight of a wrongdoing compared to other traits of the candidate? And actually, I think there are people who are doing conjoint experiments with regards to when uh, the politician was involved in corruption, but also share a uh, 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 number of other attributes, like very experienced, uh, educated, uh, has a good electoral performance, and they measure the the, mar the relative importance of, of this factor compared to the sanctioning. So yes. actually, we could do the same, but um, but here it's not the the most the important thing is but not the we, relative. We kind of have that data already, and and so this is what, what so this is I mean we, we haven't really elaborated on it, but 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 what we found was that um, like if you compare support for a politician who did the same bad thing among their supporters, as in like. Democrats in the case of fictional democratic politician versus Democrat support for a Republican, it's, it's different. So Democrats okay. want a person to resign more than they are, did the same thing 
as a as their own candidate, right? But when you compare across scandals, then it hurts the same degree. So you know what I mean? So the reaction is is the same. It just they start from a from a lower baseline. Yeah. Um, thanks for this. Really interesting. Uh, so I think actually um, I, I feel a little bad because we're just tossing in other things that you should control for. But uh, uh, I think one of the reasons the Bill Clinton scandal impeachment didn't go through was because of the sender being partisan, everybody thinking Ken Starr and Republicans were after him as much as his popularity. So you had in, in your description, you know, uh, it went out on national TV, uh, right. which sort of puts it forward as this, this uh, nonpartisan sender, mm -hmm. which uh, I, maybe the, the most problematic fictionalized thing in your study, because I, I don't think that media landscape exists anymore in America. There's no ABC or NBC that's perceived as relatively neutral for portraying these things. So if you, uh, I mean, before you conclude that uh, partisanship doesn't matter, I think you've, you've included it with your voters, but not the, the senders. Source. Yeah. I mean, is, is it possible to incorporate that without, you know, exploding it? No, I think it, it's it's a it's a good point. Um, I, I'd imagine that if we varied the credibility of the source, then uh, I like my hunch would be that it's 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 still the same thing. I mean, it, like so. It would have an effect. So if you're if you're a Democrat and you read a story about um, uh, an accusation against another Democrat on Fox News versus on uh, New York Times, you would believe the accusation from Fox News class, and probably the the, the mood. So you know, like if the accusation has some political motivations. Then you would be you you would believe it less and you would update less and so on. Mm -hmm. But like if you if you made these if they made the comparisons we make within the same kind of combination of a of source, Q politician, and per, and like party of the person thing, of which there would be nine, I think that you would still find the same thing. Maybe, I, it, but I mean, if it, you have it'd be to... interesting to see. So, yeah, I mean, yeah. just as this this different baseline that you established mm -hmm. with your partisan data is interesting, right? And I, I, you know, I can just as easily imagine that there's some sort of interaction effect there. That's, uh, but you know, no, no, I'm I, not insensitive to the fact that that just complicates your. No, no, um, I think I think that's a good point, though. Thank you. Others? Yeah. So I was wondering whether. Is there anything special about being politicians? Or is it just a general feature of how we respond to allegations of wrongdoing? So you may think that the theory of excuses goes very close to the wrongness. It's very easy to apologize for stealing a candy. It's very easy to deny it. It's very hard to deny to, to get an excuse for rape. You can't get an excuse for rape. But it's so very, very bad to apologize for rape. You cannot apologize for that. So you just kind of match. So what I was wondering is, it's just a general view of how excuses and lying goes. So is it anything specific about politicians? What do you have in mind? Like, is there like is there a theory of of excuses? Well, I think so. What, what the, the intuitions you have, I think, are, are fine. But I think just general excuses about the general intuitions about how wrongdoing and excuse goes. Imagine you had an experiment. No, it's I, not I, about the politicians. I totally agree. Just, I totally agree. Gabor stole a chiclet and then he said he didn't. And then, I don't know, John raped. And then you say, what kind of sanctions should be subject to? And you, one way that you would have exactly the same results. So political communication just makes no difference to that. Or you get very different results. And there's something about these guys being politicians. No, no, I, I totally, I, like my intuition is that these are very general. 
things. And I try to, I guess I try to look for literature, like kind of, I don't even know like what would be, like what discipline deals with this? Like psychology or? I think it's more of philosophy. <laughs> but is it like empirical? <laughs> okay, so like if, if, if any of you has some like good good books to read about that, that would be awesome. I guess I, I'm like, so I'm not, I, I don't even know like where to look for in that literature, but it would be awesome. Do you? No. Okay. <laughs> Karsten? Yeah, thanks. I have five points too, I think we'll mention. Okay, take them. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So, so is, is your puzzle really why, whether some apologize and others don't? Or is it not also when they apologize? That what is what Anna was pointing to. And maybe in your data you have, I mean, with the setup you have, I think you cannot get to the second question, which is empirically sort of closer to reality. Because everybody first denies and then they apologize, if at all. <clears throat> And then also, and that I think is partly what Andres now said, that does it matter whether the accusations have also legal implications? Mm. So uh, whether, and then the, the difference is whether you want to save your job in as a politician or whether you want to uh, pr uh, prevent that you go to jail. These are totally mm. different motivations. Um, and um, th this then leads to what uh, the third point, what Andres explicitly said, uh, you know, if a football player is accused of something, would you not get the same results or some some TV presenter? What is what is actually make what does make it a political science, so to speak? But is it a, so is it a good thing or a bad thing? Well, I mean, when you were looking for theories, so what what sort of what should you have your theory sections about? I thought it is about uh, you know electoral competition and so on. But if we now figure out it's it's so general that that you know this could also apply to a tv presenter uh, being uh, accused, uh, accused of something then you have to look for different theories so what what would make it more political science would probably help you to narrow it down um but i don't know how you can do this now ex post uh, factum as you have done the experiment already so you would have to have a third way for you make it more political i don't know how as it stands now, I mean, it's probably neither here nor there that it's so broad. But if you present to political scientists, they probably ask, what is political science about it? So that's probably the only problem you would have. The second last question. So everything was uh, sounded, I mean, was de facto U.S. political context. Does this now mean that also respondents were from the U.S.? Or did, okay, everybody was from the U.S.? Mm -hmm. So and then the last question, how general do you think these findings are? Or what are the limits? To this funny, can it only work in a bipartisan uh, setup? I mean, if it if it if it's if it's our general if, it, if it's the general theory of accusations and apologies, they probably also a cross national theory. But yeah, I I don't know. Uh, I mean, so we have data from from Slovakia, and I think the that Alex got pretty pretty similar results. It's kind of like you could make the argument it's a most different case, not most different, but a pretty different case. Um, no, I mean I think I, I I think I agree with this. I think we didn't do our best effort to like uh, no no to 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 look for like moral philosophy literature and then just say that we are like hey here's here's what everyone knows already about how these things work and we are just gonna apply it to politics. And so maybe, maybe like we don't even have a paper yet. So I don't want to say that we were not not successful in the paper. But but once we write the paper, like we, we definitely want to dig deeper into like what what is kind of the known. And, and, I mean, for for me as someone who has read a fair bit about with political behavior, public opinion, stuff like that, I've never read anything about this. So I, I kind of assume that. That knowledge exists somewhere, but probably that political scientists wouldn't be very familiar with these trade offs. I don't know. Where well, they are. I don't, know. I don't know, but I was thinking the same that this would be actually the point maybe that you do form a theory that you have different expectations towards politicians than you have for towards uh, soccer players or even your friends. And then maybe you just expect them to. <laughs> you know, be worse than your friends. And maybe this is why it doesn't work with uh, um, 
on the lower sins, right? You still find that denial should be the optimal solution instead of admitting it. And maybe it has to do really with this expectation that you do expect politicians to somehow behave differently than we, the normal, the normal people do. Or again, Karsten, I think was very right that you would have more, most likely very different expectations for uh, soccer players. And while you would punish a politician who is caught speeding, most likely you will still remain a fan of a soccer player, even if he's speeding. Mm. Or gets a speeding ticket every week. This is what I'm saying. Sorry. Sorry, I'm Ari Pix from Political Science Department. And I had two comments. One about, about the type of sins. So we probably would see that, let's say, a left wing politician who has campaigned a lot on a social justice would be much more harmed by a sexual harassment scandal maybe than this kind of much of far right politician and the other uh, uh, being outed as a gay man would be would be very bad for a for a right wing politician mm -hmm. maybe not not so bad for, for the former groups there is a difference i was just thinking that maybe there are sort of type of types of sins that that we would think about that would not be um, party so, so much uh, related by, by this stereotype. I mean, the corruption is a very good example that you take because that should uh, that should uh, resonate with, with whatever group. Mm -hmm. I was also thinking about maybe intentionally breaking election promises could be this type of sin. If a politician promises to its voters that I'm going to do this and this and that, and later you reveal that he already knew before the election there's never mm -hmm. going to be any money for it. That's a type of sin that's very political, unlike mm -hmm. unlike the other one. So this is my first comment, and the second comment relates to this generalization of theory. Is this really that different from from other humans? And I recall from, from many years ago, from undergraduate time, that there is there is a study of the game theoretical modeling of suspects' behavior in criminal sciences, where where they kind of look up. So if if somebody is accused of something, they they get inter interrogated by the police, and what's their rational behavior, whether to to confess or whether to accept actually, not even confess, whether to accept the charges or, or to deny the charges. And usually it comes down to this is that, that uh, uh, it dep really dep dependent variable there is what is the likelihood of new evidence being brought on him. And if from, the, from the police's perspective, they want, uh, want the prosecution fast, they will try to put this, throw as many things at the suspect as possible to make him think that they have a lot on him or her. Mm. And then, then they, the suspect will depend and think whether, whether it's likelihood that, he, that is, in the future the evidence will be uncovered. So there is a, there is a general model modeling about that. And mm. also the punishments matter. So for example, what's the crime? So, so what, it, what, what is, what, what's he's gonna get if, if he's gonna, uh, gonna, you know, go and make the agreement with the prosecution or whatever, what he's got, what, he, what will be his chances in the court. And then he would think about in, in my court, the chances in the court depend on what evidence the police can, can bring against him. So there are general theories about this type of behavior from firm. Even there is a consideration about false positives. In certain situation, it makes sense for the accused person to actually accept and, and confess crimes that they didn't commit. They might in a use case, for example, escape death penalty in some situation because of that. And there, I'm not sure how likely that is in case of political science, but I mean, there, there is a modeling about, about this thing to, uh, out there already. I'm not quite sure I can give you a reference from after that many years, but, but that's what I've read. So yeah, that's my two comments. Thank you. Thanks, it's very helpful. I think actually, I think what, what, what this reminds me is that we are kind of abusing the, that's the, your first comment, that is that we are kind of abusing the word hypocrisy is what this has been used in prior studies is, ex is exactly that, that, that if you are, you know, this, this is a good example. You know, like, uh, like these, I think, and there has been a bunch of uh, examples for this in, in US politics when these um, like right wing anti-immigration politicians were caught employing like illegal immigrants as maids. Yeah. And then it's like, this is, so this is like, you are also, so it's it's not only that you did something problematic, but it also shows that you you're a liar, basically, yeah, exactly. you're a hypocrite. So we so so we were not, but I think that that's super interesting and kind of related to what we do. But but yes, but we, we intentionally pick these uh, because we thought that they would neutralize mm -hmm. at least that moving part. Corruption is certainly a very good example to use. And this one, go ahead. 
Um, I'm following up on Anders and Carson on the one hand, who wanted to see something more political in there, and on Mehmet on the other side, who can you know is telling what is there about can you know a possible partisanship. Now, my argument is not empirical, but more can you know on the theoretical side. Um, could there be something like a Robin Hood effect, can you know, in terms of voting or citizens' expectations in political elites? In the sense of, can you know, let's assume we have voters who distrust the state, who don't like the state norms, can you know, who don't like to pay taxes, who don't like tax inspectors, who think somebody like us who is stealing a little bit, who is kind of, you know, involved in a little bit of corruption scandals who doesn't kind of, you know, think that everything what the state does, what the administration does is just, that's actually our best advocate in politics. And so your assumption, you start from the beginning, from the assumption that sex scandals and corruption scandals are bad. Is that true for all voters? Aren't there many voters out there who actually elect somebody into office? to do exactly kind of, you know, what they are doing afterwards, stealing a little bit, kind of, you know, a little bit of sex scandals. And that's the best way of kind of, you know, showing their voters, we are there to obstruct to the administration of checking your taxes as well. And that would probably quite massively, if you would have cases like that therein, that would quite massively kind of, you know, change, at least for a group of voters, which definitely will can you know be different along partisan lines and this will definitely be much more important in the corruption experiment and in the sex scandal experiment will lead to completely different can you know incentives you might also have it in the sex scandal can you know part where it's less only about can you know what the state does but about we all think that society social norms about behavior and sexual matters are exaggerated but nobody is allowed to speak out and so somebody a politician who is having you know who is, who is a rapist or who um has betrayed his his wife can you know might be one of us as well the same way i don't know what you would need to do in terms of the experiments it's more like a theoretical point than a kind of you know empirical probably you would need to have much more nuances not only about denial or apologies but the exact wording of the denial and the exact wording of the apologies can you know what signal you are sending there? Yep, I think one thing we we were not controlling for this like consciously, but forever. But 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 we but try to make the case that these corruptions are for self-interest. It's not for like I don't know, kind of you know, in this term, it's not a Robin Hood effect because the politician was corrupt for his own self-interest. You have a too narrow view of Robin Hood. Robin Hood, if he um, can, if, you know, steals for himself, he also allows others to steal or not to pay taxes. That's my definition of Robin Hood, which might be the, the, wrong, the wrong term to use. And, and also the other that the, the one who benefits now, for example, the media mogul, who is again, could be like establishment kind of figure where these kind of anti-establishment sentiments could actually um, like, go the other way around. Yeah. Just checking the chat. I mean, Matt, Matt is also racist. Right. I think that's also the last one. There's also a hand in the maybe. Matt Let's listen to Matt Hello. Thank you. Thank you. I have, I have no clue who is with you in the room because we, we only see the presenter and, and the screen behind him. So I expect it's quite a crowd. I at least heard many questions from the floor. I, I have two, I have one question and, and one comment. The comment is that I'm really curious what will happen if also in your second study where you update the information and, and tell them, okay, it really did happen or did not and how that influences then people's uh, verdict. Uh, I, I wonder what happens to the verdict if you include this control variable of partisanship, because I expect it to have a major impact, especially in the US, because people would say, well, uh, you know, you said he did it. Who said he did it? He says he didn't. So he didn't. Yeah. And nobody can convince me otherwise, because I follow Trump. Yeah. If, if so many people still believe the elections were stolen, 
then actually uh, yeah, the truth, as you presented in your experiment, doesn't matter. So that, that would be, uh, I'm really curious what happens uh, in your second project. And then uh, when I read your, uh, uh, the abstract uh, that was circulated uh, in advance of the departmental uh, seminar, it says in the final sentence that, well, you do two things and for both you find proof. You look at political behavior, yeah, what do politicians do? Um, and, and you look at voter evaluations of behavior. But I, I guess that, that you only do one thing in your project, you look at how, how people evaluate behavior. And you don't actually look at, at what, what people, what politicians do, because that, that will be a different project, granted, but a very interesting one. Because if you are right, uh, and, and I take it that, uh, which also my four-year-old daughter already knows, uh, first deny, and if you're confronted with inevitable evidence, confess and apologize. Uh, so if, if this is generally seen as, as the best strategy, then you would expect real world politicians to, to, to do this. So maybe you would need to have come up with a database uh, of yeah, recording all, all actions uh, that politicians uh, followed after they, were, after they got involved in a political scandal. And then if you are right, this is the pattern that you would uh, expect to see. Denial first, uh, if confronted by evidence, apology later, right? But that's that's you would need different data for that part of the project. Thanks. Yeah, I think it would be awesome. I think that I mean to to, to get this database. I really I, I thought about this a lot. Um, it, just one thing about so so I still still about this. Do be like people wouldn't really believe. Uh, this is so weird. If I want to talk to you, I need to show my back to you. Anyway, Maybe you can uh, turn on that camera. Yeah. Yeah, I guess I could. That's what I'm trying. To don't bother. Don't bother. No, it just it does work. So which one do you think? You have to try out this. Yeah, probably. Ah. No, the other no, one. Oh, that, um, then this was the other one. The other one. Uh, no. It was still the other one. It was me. No, it is Jabra vision. Is it yes. also not Jabra? The first very top. The next button you press will shut the entire system down. So please uh, <laughs> don't. <laughs> yeah. So um, so basically what we do with this evidence phase, and I think something that's, that's interesting even in our data, that there are people that still, so if you, okay, I'm not gonna share this again, but, but, but we still find that there are some people that are, that we see the condition which says that there is evidence pointing, showing, undeniably that the politician is guilty. And then we ask them if they think that the politician is guilty, they say, no, I don't think they are guilty. And then presumably if we gave them a source view that they, that they find um, unconvincing. So like, as I said before, <clears throat> you would, the Republican, you would say that, oh, like New York Times said that this Republican politician did such and such for sure, then it would make it like even less, like we, we would make this treatment even more powerful. And when, if you just, in, like, if you just substitute in to our model, what this would say that the more polarization you have, so the less, the less extent voters find all party sources convincing, the less, incentives they have to to apologize to apologize right because the reason why they, they want to apologize because they are they are they kind of catch they're caught guilty but you are less likely to get caught guilty if no one believes um you know like bad stuff about you because they, it would only be shown by so I, I feel like this is very important but this is like, I mean, I'm like pretty sure that this is what we would find that people update less from an from a hostile source. But I, I, I agree that we could, in principle, do like a follow up study and we could incorporate it to, to, to the model. 
So I think maybe 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 that's maybe that's that's, that's important enough to to actually demonstrate empirically. I'll think about it. Uh, I think Sammy has been trying to ask something for mm -hmm. forever, but this this his question is so long that it's been all, always been easier to just listen to. Okay, uh, sure, I, I wrote just something in the chat, but I could just say them out loud. Uh, so the what the first thing is, I was wondering if there would be um, sort of room to test for like a third strategy of, of response, where basically they admit that they have done something, but they don't see anything wrong with what they did. That would sort of be with, um, you know, when there's um, an instance of a politician saying something, what a portion of society would deem incriminating, but they would uh, sort of like, the one thing that comes to my mind is saying, them saying it's, it's locker room talk. Like there was, a, that was sort of the excuse that was often mentioned when related to uh, Trump. Um, and basically that would be a strategy of saying like, yes, I did some, you know, I did this thing, but I don't see why it would be a big deal or why I would need to apologize. So that's something in between of an, apology and, and denial. And the other thing, and this relates to, I think what others have been saying is that there should be a distinction between say what we expect behavior wise between uh, soccer players and, and politicians. But I think this sort of distinct expectations of behavior could be extended to um, sort of, to have them within political circles. Uh, I think we, voters would expect different things from someone who has a reputation of being sort of controversial, especially like Silvio Berlusconi, and they would expect different things from him compared to say, Mike Pence. Obviously they don't come from the same country, but I'm just using them as examples of different sort of public images and then sort of different expectations people may have of their own behavior and how sort of serious certain things are uh, when they do it and whether it sort of corresponds with their public image and the response would be like, yes, you know, what did you expect? It's him versus when something comes completely out of left field considering someone's uh, reputation. Yeah, so one thing is that our apology is not just an apology. So we kind of try to try to make it more nuanced. And in case of the apology of Linets, we actually have a part of blame diver or kind of blame reduction, that we say that, okay, I accepted this gift, or the politician says that, okay, he accepted this gift, but this is like how Washington works, and this is not influencing what he's doing as a politician. Uh, he's representing still the people. So we try to make it a bit more nuanced, the apologies, which are not just straight the apologies in that, yeah, sorry for this. I think the other, so I think like analytically, the, so I, I totally agree with you, and I think, so even though we, we, we try to define, we want to bake into our definition of a scandal that someone is caught doing, or someone is accused of doing something that's kind of like universally considered a bad thing. But I think that the problem to, with this too is that that, um, that we were trying, we were we were struggling with, is that one of the main moving parts in our model is the seriousness of the scandal. And so I think all these things you're, you're saying, and you, you also kind of thought a bunch about these, is that in principle, a politician could in, influence both the likelihood that the wrongdoing was committed as well as the seriousness of it. So you could say that, yes, I did it, but I don't think it's a, a big deal. Then the politician would try to kind of shift the, the seriousness and it would be kind of like tough to to make this tractable in our in our model or even empirically because now we kind of so like if you remember back to these graphs we basically measured seriousness of these scandals by like the, the average grade that respondents gave to these scandals before they read the accusations so so we in a way we we, we you want to have some kind of like, like ground, no, what do you sort of say that? Like, um, we're not pin down what seriousness means. And if you think of seriousness as also something that's just, you know, like could be manipulated, then it, it makes it, I mean, more realistic, but also kind of like 
hard to to follow. But I, I agree with you. I also totally take your your point about you know it, it mattering if, if you're gonna make it very abstract and you, the people's uh, reaction could be driven by their perception of like specific politicians. I think that's a great point too. So thank you. Otila. Do we have more in the chat? Otila. Otila said yeah, something. Yeah. Uh, I mean on, on the chat line, my question. So that there might be other strategies like simply ignoring the accusation, discrediting the accuser, threatening, blackmailing the accuser. Uh, accusing others as well, partial confession or just relativizing the case, and there might be others. And uh, uh, don't you think that it should be somehow included uh, the more uh, encompassing uh, analysis? That's it. Yeah, I. I, I... I think eventually, in order to have a general theory of uh, of responses to, to political scandals, they 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 do. I think it would be really hard to um. I, I think like we we have like a very specific story here that's about these possible things which are in a nice contrast to each other. But I also agree that if we, if our goal was to kind of fully describe the possibilities, then these would definitely be on the list. So, yeah. Okay. If there's no questions, I do have two comments. I have oh, you do that. Five more minutes. Yes, I can jump in. Actually, it goes on what Andre said before, whether it's a like human nature, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter whether it's politician or football player or whatever. And I think it's good if it is, because you can use it to your advantage and actually, instead of making a randomized experiment with politicians, make a randomized experiment with people, but putting them in a similar setting where mm. they care about uh, the probability whether it will be revealed or not, the truth will be revealed or not, and maybe other things that you want to control for, and just check how they react, because if this is how we as human humans just react and it doesn't matter whether you're politicians or not then you can just then say okay this this is how politicians would update or whatever i mean it seems to be like this right obviously politicians have a different setup in terms of what they care about but you might be able to re represent this in an experiment so this is the first thing that i was thinking when Andres brought it up that this is actually a human nature right it's like a very good comment and the second thing I was thinking about is related to what you mean by seriousness mm -hmm. of the scandal. I think, so right now, it's, I, I think it's good that you measure this, but it seems to be that some scandals might be more important or not in terms of whether they question the competence or the reliability of the politician in doing their job, as opposed to just making something which is immoral, right? It's like... Uh, sexual scandal, yes, it is immoral, people don't like it, but this doesn't question their competence in doing, uh, being good, good manager or whatever uh, as a politician. So therefore there might be different strategies in terms of whether you apologize for it or not. In terms of, does this question in its core, uh, for example, corruption would be, it questions in its core that I'm a good politician because I'm basically selling out, right? Well, sexual scandal mm. it's bad but it's it's nothing related to the job that i'm doing right but this is exactly what i think was the, the point legal. that you were when the legal you talk point. about the representative you might have the expectation that actually they are better than you right or they behave differently because they are public figures mm. and this is why it might be extra costly for them even if they have an extra marital affair which is not for us so this is why I meant that I would actually start from what type of expectations you have towards those politicians. Because maybe Daniel is also true that, you know, we expect the worst out of these people. And right. then who cares that they took a small bribe or whatever? <laughs> like, that's maybe exactly that. He just took a small one. It's, it's showing that he's the better one. 
the thing is, it, it would be hard to. Sorry, just, just I'm thinking of is that how would you? Because if you if you wanted to, to to test if people kind of react differently to stuff done by politicians versus just like random people, then like you would want to find some like outcomes over which you can compare, right? Because you know, like I'm say, like I would say that hmm, if someone uh, stole a bunch of money, I'm pretty sure that it, that happened. I would want them to resign. And if I learned that, I don't know, like our rector stole a bunch of money, I would want her to resign. But if I learned that you, you know, like I, there is not, there is another sort of equivalent. You know what I mean? Uh, because or maybe like in a business, like, or maybe there is. I mean, maybe if, you, if it's if it's like a non-governmental leader, but like a business leader, you would want them to resign. If this questions their competence or their ability to do the job. Okay. I mean, if it's a private sector person, why would I care if it would be corporation leader? I mean, there's a lot of corruption in, in corporations as well, where basically employees do all sorts of thing, things. They don't even have to do the procurement law and stuff, but I, I would, wouldn't care because it's the shareholder's problem. But I, for a country, I'm the shareholder too, so I do care there. Right. And then for a politician, I think the theory why we want them to be better is that I look at the politician and says, if he's as good as me, why is he there, not me? I could be doing this as well. If I want them to be there, there we are electing them there because they should be better. But one thing I was thinking about purely human perspective of the sort of the size of the scene and the money is that I would humanly understand much more a person who stole a very, very large amount of money <laughs> than I would if someone took a very like what was it the example like sixteen thousand dollars whatever the 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 bribe was is like really man you sold yourself for sixteen thousand dollars and for this you will do the antitrust law for him and then i would be no but if he took out uh, took like a lot i was thinking like yeah that's wrong but you know i'm a human too <laughs> so. but this is a good so do you just getting it back to your your suggestion like or like any like anyone's opinion of that like if you if you did an experiment where you kind of like flip the roles and say that hey imagine that you're a politician and you are you steal a bunch of money and you were accused of that like would you apologize or would you deny it and we kind of like found some patterns like would you like buy that or would it be like weird i think the way you presented it, it might be like difficult for them to put themselves into these shoes mm -hmm. because they might have expectations what a politician should be so they might be playing this role and so on mm -hmm. but if you put them in a more natural situation where they have actually to make a decision uh i, I think it might be helpful to look in this uh, psychological studies uh on kids where they put kids in the room and leave chocolate there and say don't eat the chocolate and then check what happens and Right. Some of them do, and so on, and mm. then ask them whether I don't know. There's was something like this where you put them in a natural situation, mm. the same incentives, where yeah. I have another comment about this. That probably applies to politicians as well, but there have been experience. I think that was done in the US or Canada that I read about, where in a corporation they. In, in, it made a system that every morning a bakery will be, bring like um, donuts there and on the floor and they are just put for free for not, not for taking for everybody but it's with expectation that people will give put a little bit of money in a box so that the bakery will have money to make new ones and they found out that the worst worst ret return rate was on the floor where the executives were so that that was the only floor that didn't make any sense uh, sense um, there, there are no floors that people put enough money that uh, were expected donation but the worst outcome was were, were there mm -hmm. so and people who end up in a very top seem to be much more say rational if they don't have to put the dollar dollar into the into the box they are least likely to uh, to do it and i guess there is a similar way with politicians as well, uh, as well that people who end up in a very high position they behave more what like homo economicus in a sense that they they rationalize their resources and their time so that makes them a little bit different as well and that probably makes them engage in all sorts of behaviors that that, that other people would not necessarily do either but i'm not sure how you can plug into this model <laughs> sorry about 
I think both the responses which you got are giving you a notion which I would share that can, you know, um, this kind of abuse of power, corruption, maybe also sexual abuse is happening in the gray zone of things which can, you know, are not very clear whether they are legit legitimate or not. And then if, if we are not called, it goes fine. If maybe we see that's a common practice, that's how everybody else is doing it. That's how things are done. We are widening the gray zone. And eventually, can you, you know, once we can become the president, we no longer speak of donuts, but we speak of millions and of billions. Mm -hmm. And we have practiced this throughout all our life. Mm -hmm. If this notion of widening the gray zone is accurate, Forget about can you know experiments where you can put people in the shoes of politicians they were not socialized into but move back to the donuts. Thanks so much. Thank you. Very thank, you. thank you guys for the awesome comments. And also online, thank you. Thank you.